The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay. Now, this should be the most interesting class of the semester. Possible. What do y'all think of possible? Oh, this is Robert. We were discussing earlier that we can't wait to hear why part of why. Why? Well, let's go. Let's do the facts first. Let's tell the story. Let's start. Uh, let's just go back and forth, round and round, until we get it done. Yeah, well, we'll Well, I think what the uh, author is doing there uh, is emphasizing that uh, the first principle of moral behavior is family, kinship. And that uh, we have to know his lineage before we can know him and whatever he does. I think there's another, uh, and, that, and um, that's a big difference between Parsifal and Mallory. This is your, this is your uh, King Arthur's legend in, in the first form. Okay, this one here. Uh, that is that there's a lot of attention given to um, the morality of being a knight. Uh, but the first principle is, uh, first principle I think is kinship. And an interesting principle is that it's immoral to, to mistreat a kinship, a, a, a relative, even if you don't know that this direct, the person is a relative. I mean, that, I mean, you're not supposed right. to. I mean, these principles, there's all this time spent on who his father is and his father is. Um, That's right. Know right. So, and, and there's, there's this big to do about all of these relationships. And you don't discover them immediately, you find them out later. Okay, so, uh, Parzival's father. Goes out, gets married uh, to a no. Does a, does a uh, heroic deed. Marries a queen as a result of it. Thanks. Uh, gets tired of being a king and goes back out on the road, so to speak. Marries again. Finds no legal or moral problem in doing that because one uh, wife was a pagan and the other one was a Christian. <laughs> well, keep going. Keep y'all get in. I want to hear more about these stories. You can and you can do it bullet wise. Just you don't have to go from the beginning to the end. What what were some of the things that struck you about this? And then we're going to tie it all in at the end. Make sure we get the facts straight first. And there's some of the things he did. Yep. Here's a lady. Here's a lady. Yeah. And, but I guess Gamera is gone by the time Parsifal was born. Maybe dead. Yeah. yeah. He dies in Baghdad in uh, in Asia. He goes to fight there and dies. And dies. Yeah, they are afraid that some other person might uh, take over his property and do her and her child some harm. And she doesn't want Parsifal to know about knighthood. She doesn't want him to be like his father. Right. 
Say, that's for me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't. I didn't remember that, but I. I uh, you don't learn that until later. Yes, towards. The Fisher King. Yes. Now let's talk about the Fisher King. Let's go into the Fisher King in some detail. Okay. Uh, when does he encounter the Fisher King? Out looking for adventure again. And even this is day. Maybe This is the Grail, Grail King. Uh, and he doesn't know he's the Grail King at first. All he sees is a man out in a boat. Right, it's book five. Uh, you can read uh, quick portions of it. If, if that's legitimate. Second, uh, the way I look at it, the first principles of uh, morality for him are kinship, and the second set of principles are uh, chivalry, which are connected to in some way. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's, I want to delve into this question. Yeah, the, the notion of admitting wrongdoing and wanting to atone for it, atonement, is sort of a major theme in this book. The, to me, the mistake or the sin seems sort of trivial, like not <laughs> not asking you the question out of politeness is not a compelling sin to me or a compelling wrongdoing, but it's what's used in the story, and Parsifal, right, feels very guilty about it and wants to atone for it, like makes it his mission to right, that was my first make his way back to the <laughs> Okay, now, I don't know if you all read Joseph Campbell. Okay. Uh, the only reason I haven't assigned Joseph Campbell yet is that I can't figure out which one to assign. <laughs> because uh, I, I, I'd have him reading four or five of them and watching uh, this uh, TV program where, you know, Bill Moyers? He does one with Bill Moyers uh, called The Power of Death. He's a spectacular lecturer, and he's got some, uh, I've got some videotapes of his in his classes. Um, so I think that, uh, well, for me, uh, Joseph, Joseph Campbell is one of my maybe top five, if you want to put it that way, scholars. Now, here's the big issue that Joseph Campbell makes out of the question. Okay. Campbell starts off with a poet by the name of T.S. Eliot. Got a Nobel Prize for literature. And one of, po one of Eliot's pieces is called The Wasteland. Uh, and in The Wasteland, 
The wasteland is a place where everybody does what everybody else expects you to do. Okay. So you never break out and find your individual, what he calls bliss, what I call destiny. You never break out of that. You're always, you come in, you learn the rules, and you follow them. Okay. Uh, which is good 99% of the time. The question is, when do you break out? And by what reason do you break out? Parsifal really wants to be a good knight. I'm sorry. A um, competent knight. <laughs> I'm just playing with words right now. Good knight, okay. Uh, and he's been taught very well. Remember his teacher? And the teacher said, told him, uh, virtually, when you go to somebody's house, you don't start quizzing. You ask them uh, questions. That's one of the rules of Shiva. And Parzival wants to be uh, true to all of the rules of Shiva. But he's sitting there talking to his host, and his host is in pain. And the authors have made it clear that this is the worst kind of pain that a man can endure. Okay. Now, actually, the worst kind of pain, I've heard, I've had six physicians tell me that uh, kidney stone is the worst kind of pain a man can endure. It's man's equivalent of uh, a woman's childbirth, natural childbirth. It's worse than pains in the army. Okay. And I've had them, I know. But there is nothing fearful attached to the kidney stone. I have not lost my manhood when I pass a kidney stone. This man lost his manhood. And not only that, but the tip of that thing is still stuck in it. So then you ask yourself if, if possible, is going to lift himself up above the rule. Now's the time to do it. <laughs> okay, you got a colleague sitting there suffering the worst pain he could ever suffer, and he's going to die of it. The least you could do is say, oh my God, I feel sorry for you. Possible didn't do it. Now, there's another game that everybody plays, particularly parents. There's some lessons you cannot teach a child by giving them the answer first. <laughs> You got to say, you got to put the child in this situation. You got, everybody does it. There are certain situations you get in where uh, you just can't tell you, if you're going to give a person some kind of a test. You can't tell them, uh, you know, uh, certain things. Like, for example, when I had my first test on the job, they couldn't tell me, oh, we got that covered in case you mess up. I had to believe that this was it. So they couldn't tell him to ask that question and that the result would be that he would become the Grail King. He had to break out of the rule and show that he was worthy. So there's that big issue now with the Grail King. And um, possible uh, felt bad and, uh, uh, that he missed the chance. He felt bad that he uh, should have shown some compassion, at least verbally. Uh, and, uh, but the real issue is that uh, this test was one of his fitness to be the Grail King. And the fitness was not measured in terms of obedience to the rules. The fitness was measured in terms of leaping, quote unquote, above the rules. Uh, there's a film called uh, called uh, the Cincinnati Kid. And it's the same theme as uh, the Hustler, except that the Hustler was about pool uh, uh, professional pool players, and uh, Cincinnati Kid was about professional uh, card players. And the, the film ends, I'm assuming that you all not going to watch the film, won't be disappointed by me telling you the ending. No, y'all won't watch it because it's in black and white. <laughs> I think it's in black and white. It might be, might be color. 
But anyway, the film ends where the main character loses this card game. And he loses it to the old master. He's beaten him up until the very end. And he loses all his money. And he comes up to the master at the end, and he says to him, says, uh, why didn't, why did you give up that key? Not, well, he said, that was uh, against all of the rules of uh, probability. Everybody knows it. And the old man said, the, prob the question is not about making mistakes. The question is about when to make it. <laughs> In other words, he threw the guy off by throwing away that key. Uh, so um, once, when the time comes for you to break the rule, you got to know that, the time, that this is the time and be prepared to suffer the consequences. And possible wasn't willing to do that, and possible had to mature. How long was it, how many years passed between the time that he uh, missed his chance and the time that he came back and became Grail King? And he's looking for this thing all along. The castle disappears. Remember, he gets up the next morning, and he hears uh, the knights thundering out of the castle on his way, their way someplace, and he gets all dressed up and goes out to follow them. He can't find them. He turns around to go back, and the castle's gone. And he spends the next X amount of time to find, go back and find the castle. Uh, my calculation was 20 years. Uh, I want you to take some time, if you dispute that, uh, whether you, uh, to give that some thought, maybe look through the book a little bit more. He was out there for quite a while. And after he has all of these exploits, uh, then he has proved himself worthy. Okay. Um... They never say exactly. Yeah. And I didn't want to go get one of the cliff notes or anything like that to look it up. I just did not want to do that. Yeah. And so I went back and sort of reading and taking little pieces. Uh. And my cat, like I said, there is a good answer to that. If you go to the humanities department, they'll all know the number. Mm -hmm. All right. But I didn't want to do it. I wanted to have fun doing it on my own. And I want to leave that to you all. Uh, but my calculation was 20 years. Um, in those 20 years, he didn't necessarily have any capacity to be all of a sudden. Oh, I should have, I feel so awful. I should have asked him about his illness. I feel bad, I need to go back. Like, other people told him that he messed up, which is an interesting take. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, this is another uh, trait of uh, many uh, mythic heroes, uh, and that is they all have at least one fatal character flaw. Fatal. If you read Oedipus. Uh, you go back to the Trojan Wars. No matter who they are, they all have some very bad, bad is not the word, fatal is the word. Uh, even if it doesn't kill them, it kills their careers, it does all of these terrible things. Uh, and and does that ha is there a lesson in all of that? Uh, 
Well, I think one lesson is that if you're going to look for somebody to pattern your life after in any way, in any particular way, or if you're going to advise your children to be like somebody else, you're not going to find anybody that's perfect. Unless you've got a religious bent. But uh, you're, not going to, you're going to find people who make mistakes. And the heroes, at least all of the ones that I have read, are the ones who not only do great deeds, but make big mistakes. I mean, when they make a mistake, it is big. Terrible to them, terrible to everybody around. Uh, and I think that's the way it is. If you, play in the, if you play in the big game, you make big mistakes. You make big gains when you make them, but you make big mistakes too. Um, yeah, tell, let's talk about his character some more. What about was did he did his character change as he got older? Yeah, I think he did. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the way he went, went yeah. frustrates me is that the way he became a knight was by killing another knight in order to get his clothing. Yeah. <laughs> No. The major mistake is not asking the question of the king. Right. So, I don't know. I, I don't know what we're supposed to do with that. Just accept that the, he had to kill the knight to get the. He did, it, was, it wasn't a heroic deed that made him become a knight. Unless maybe I'm, it is somehow heroic and I'm missing it. No, that, I wouldn't call that heroic. Uh, <laughs> because. There was nobody, nobody else, no one else's interest at stake that he was protecting. Um, there's a scene I'm trying to think of it uh, in the film. There's one of my one of my favorite films. Um, I'm trying to think of what I think it was Robin, one of Robin, one of the Robin Hood movies, where Robin Hood gets into this sword fight with this knight, and he doesn't know it's a, uh, it's. Uh, uh, Richard, and he, they're fighting, and Richard goes with a lunge, and Robin Hood steps out of the way, and Richard gets his sword stuck into a tree. Now, they're fighting to the death. This is serious. And Robin Hood, I think it is, puts down his sword and goes, helps him pull it out of the tree. <laughs> He got an opportunity to stab the man in the back. But chivalry says, you don't do that. All right. So uh, they got this, these rules of chivalry. Will, I think, they, I think if you follow the rules of chivalry, there's something about it that's, that's, that is hero-making in it. It helps you get there. Uh, I don't think that those are heroic deeds, but it, it sort of gets you into a mindset that there's something that's higher than you. And uh, that you, I mean, if a man, if, you, if you're going to kill a man, you don't kill him by stabbing him in the back or certain kind of things. You just don't do these things. Um, what about his half-brother? <laughs> you see any point to uh, the story of him and his half-brother? Fear fees, that's the best pronunciation I can get out of it. Well, he, he certainly seems essential to Parsifal's eventual saving of the Grail castle and of the Fisher King. If they sort of they go there together in the end. And you could probably argue that if he hadn't met up with Fear Fees, he wouldn't have gone. Why do you think the author 
made this bizarre uh, characterization of fear feet as being patched black and white. Like a like like a pinto horse. Why do you that's sort of bizarre. Why would why would an author just do that? Uh, is there is there any connect I mean, why would an author do that? That was not uh, the LIGO, I think. Why would an author do that? Well, I'll tell you what I think. Well, I'll tell you what Joseph Campbell says, and then I'll tell you what I think, which is almost the same thing. Uh, this author wants to reconcile the heathens and the pagans. And the only thing that's going to impress possible in terms of reconciliation is kinship. <laughs> so I think what he's trying to say is that Fear Fees is half black, half white, which he was. But, it, but, for, but, the, but, but, the, but the key issue was pagan versus Christian. And that the two of them became the best of friends at the end. So I think the author was trying to say that um, this, these are the uh, early Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, that all of this, all of this hatred between Christians and pagans got to go. And he tries to do it in the most compelling way to somebody like possible, make it part of the That's right. So he still had to be baptized. <laughs> now, well, uh, let's uh, dig into that one. Um, at the time civilizations were created around the world uh, independently of one another. Uh, it was motivated by two things. Number one, well, it was motivated by the weather. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a time when there were these grasses in, that, could, that could sustain hip, a large population. Uh, and we have the uh, wheat cultures in the Middle East, the rice cultures in the East, the corn cultures in the uh, Western, uh, in the Americas, in the Western Americas. Uh, they could sustain large cultures, and the cultures did not have to be nomadic or semi-nomadic. They could stay in one place. The other thing was, that around that time, was that human beings uh, had figured out how to herd animals. So instead of going out hoping you see one one day and killing it and hoping it doesn't kill you, you can just herd the animals right along and take one whenever you get ready. So you have two kinds of cultures. You have the herding culture and you have uh, the agrarian culture. The herding is still moving around. The agrarian is settled. Okay. Um, the herding cultures are kinship societies. Civilization was made up by different kinship groups. It was a multicultural society. So the rules of social order for a uh, for civilization 
were more strict or stricter or more or, or social order was more problematic for cultures, for, for, for civilized cultures, than it was for nomadic herder, herding cultures because all you did was obey your father and your father obeyed his grand, your grandfather. You obeyed your mother and your mother obeyed her grandmother. But when you've got different families in the, living in the same place, how do you keep them in order? And uh, here's how they did it. Religion. <laughs> okay. So they, they invented great priesthoods. And the great priesthoods uh, found it increasingly difficult to keep the social order. So what they did was they had to find ways of keeping people anchored uh, to, to an idea that was compelling on them. And the shaman, with, talk, with, with uh, his um, insights in the unconscious, uh, just became not very compelling any longer because people did not share the same unconscious. They were different from different groups, different families. So what happened in the end was that um, the a priesthood developed, probably not out of the shaman. Because a shaman has a personality that requires a discussion. So I don't see three or four shamans getting down and saying, let's start a priesthood uh, and work together in a hierarchy. I don't see that. Um, a shaman becomes a shaman by way of having, uh, I hope you all can tolerate some of these diversions because it's just too interesting. A shaman becomes a shaman by virtue of having had a traumatic experience in childhood. I'm sorry, the word shaman describes a... Witch doctor. Okay. In very early prehistoric... Yes. Of... Yes. Uh, but you can find people who do not have the function of a shaman uh, in society today. Uh, one one uh, very good example... Of a, sh of a person who has the same personality uh, as a shaman uh, is this mathematician named Ramanujan. He's an Indian. And the story is that when he was a child, his parents would get into these violent arguments. And he would crawl under the bed with a pencil and paper and try to do math problems to keep it out of his head. Uh, what happened in the end was that he became a very great mathematician, but they call him an intuitive mathematician. He could not prove to you any of his results, but his results worked. One of the things he did was, uh, now here's something to, for you to look up in the details. I'm going to recite from memory. Ramanujan found a way to discern whether a 20-digit number was a prime number or not. And he figured it out by hand. I mean, there's a hand method where you could figure out uh, whether it's prime or not. Uh, and um, somebody used that method uh, to, sh to um, frustrate the U.S. military because uh, the military uh, had uh, its um, ICBMs, its intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, their orders were coded in prime numbers. You could break the code by at hand. The idea is you could still break the code by a computer, but you'd have to run the computer for a month. By that time, they would change the code. Well, if you could come in there and do it by hand, you could knock it down. They said that the, the, the story is that they had to reconfigure the whole thing. Ramanujan was there. So we're, we're talking about a person who really is an outsider, uh, a person who really lives in another mind state, a state of mind. Um, 
I saw some people who had that state of mind. I saw a program on television, a documentary, who talked about uh, savants and other types of uh, people that have the shaman, shamanistic personality. They all had these traumatic childhood experiences where they tried to get away from the world. And uh, they showed this one guy. Now, this this what I'm telling you now is good scientific stuff. We're not talking about alien visitation. This is very well documented. These people were stud have been studied in college by researchers. And stuff. They had this one man who was about, when he was 50 years old, he could tell you the weather of every day of his life. Well, after three or four. You say, well, what was the weather like uh, November 6, 1942? I rained that day. And they'd go back and check, and sure enough, it was. Now, how do you explain that? Well, it turns out, basically, he knew nothing else. But he had memorized those things to keep whatever problem he had as a child out of his mind. Uh, and so they tried to rehabilitate him. And they showed a scene where he goes to the street, to cross the street, and the, the sign is saying, go. And he gets out in the middle of the seat, street, and the sign says, stop. And he stops. <laughs> you know, he can he just doesn't know. I think his mother kept him close to her all his life. He just didn't know those things. The more he got into society, got a job, he could only hold a job for something like one hour a day at first. You know, cleaning the, t busing tables at a restaurant. The more he got socialized, the more he began to lose that skill. <laughs> um, they say uh, that the, um, the bards that uh, back in um, 400 BC, ones who were going around talking about Homer and all of that, they said that they could tell, they had memorized, I read some place where they where these people had memorized something like a million lines of verse before. Now, a million lines of verse. So I sat down one day and I did a calculation. I know how long the lines are. About the same length of a line in Shakespeare. So I did, you know, back of the hand kind of a calculation. Ten volumes of Shakespeare. Now, I concluded from that television program I saw, that these pro people probably didn't know a whole lot of anything else. <laughs> uh, one other program that I saw uh, was one where they were talking about, about um, these professional Scrabble players. Actually, I think, yeah, they, they play for money. And they talked about how many words these people had memorized. And not only that, but they had a skill to, um, to take the words on their uh, palette, I mean the letters, and be able to turn them around in their minds to see the patterns before they put them down. We try to do, I try to do that. If it's obvious, I can do it. I can do it with three letters if, if there's one. But seven, eh, takes an effort. These people just do it like that. And... Um, then they, and they had all of these interviews with the, the winners. It turns out in the end that the winners know the meanings of very few words. <laughs> but they know a word from a non-word. <laughs> and they interviewed some of them at home. And, and these people had shamanic personalities. I mean... Um, uh, you just don't see two of them sitting down for long, organizing together. Okay. So in my mind, I don't see shaman. Uh, oh, I'll tell you where else you can find shaman, a shaman. I knew a person who was not a shaman, but she said she was taught by a shaman, so she knows some of the shaman skills. Native Americans, they still have, you can still find a shaman out there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> So what happened was, going back to civilization, 
uh, the priests were able to find cycles that were connected first with the moon, then with the sun, by which they were able to get, organize everybody to plant and to reap. And that kept, and so therefore, it's very easy to understand from that who invented mathematics and astronomy. Okay, it was these priests. Uh, now I'm getting to my point. Now I'm getting to my point. Um, Joseph Campbell makes the big point that in primitive society, um, no, in, in the transition from small primitive societies to big ones, okay, instead of having six or seven people in a family group, now you're talking about hundreds, and they're and they're and they're um, uh, herding these the, the, these these uh, reindeer or cattle. Here's what happens. Now, Joseph Campbell, I think, is right about this. He does a lot of anthrop cultural anthropology. This is germane to all of this, and I'll make all of this make sense before the class is out. I don't ask you to trust me, but that's a promise. All right. Joseph Campbell says that once you have a successful society, successful in terms of holding people together and feeding everybody, you will find that your biggest problem is not family. The biggest problem is not disease. He says, you want to guess what he says your biggest problem is? Men with free time. Because you get a bad combination. The women don't have free time. They got kids. That's, a, that's 24 hours a day. Men with free time. Here's the bad combination. Because everybody's, what they do, they, they, if they, if they want to cheat, they just go out and get one. They got free time. Men with free time. Here's the bad combination. Free time uh, and inclination to organize in hierarchical groups. And guess what the last piece of the puzzle is? High levels of testosterone. Okay. High levels of testosterone. Right. That's a bad combination. Free time. <laughs> men. Men with free time. Okay. So what happens is that to let out that energy, One of the things that men learned to do was to hunt other men. That is the root of the heroic story. And what and, and, and these ancient or herding societies, anthropologists call warrior warrior herding societies. They were warriors. Civilization was priests and farmers. All right. Now here's the last piece of this puzzle. As civilization got more complicated, you get more people, you got bigger problems. Uh, the priests can't handle keep everybody together just on holidays, and you know and and, and Sundays, if you want to put it like that. Um, you have to have a principle of force. So what happened was that the, the warrior herders, the young men, would get out and say, well, look, let, we got to prove our manhood. So they run out to uh, or, or, uh, run out over to some civilization and kill somebody, steal, steal some women. Uh, then the civilization started building walls to keep them out. And then what happened was the priests started hiring them as mercenaries. 
the priests started hiring them as, first of all, mercenaries whenever they, uh, when, whenever one civilized group thought that they needed something from another civilized group. Okay, some bugs got in and ate all of the wheat over here. These people got wheat over there. They're not going to give you any wheat over here, so you hire some of these mercenaries, go beat up on a couple of them, and bring some wheat back. Uh, then you have all of these problems within the culture. People are fighting. Okay. So then you hire these people not as mercenaries, but you hire them as police. Do you see it? The invention of the king. <laughs> you already got the high priest. The king is really an outsider. That's what happened to the Roman Empire. The Romans came in. They just didn't subdue everybody and beat everybody out. They just came in and became the police. They left a lot of the, the, the high priest in control. So what I'm saying now is that the religion in, religion in warrior societies is, a, is based on kinship. And they are... They, they don't believe that they lose anything by adopting your religion. You can't adopt theirs because you're not a member of the family. So warrior herding societies are not like civilized societies. Civilized societies compete to debt to the death over religion. Warrior herding societies doesn't matter that much to them. The pagans that we're talking about in Possible were warrior herding Arabs. Okay? So, so, so Fear of Fiends really wasn't giving up a whole lot to become a Christian. <laughs> Not a whole lot. I mean, uh, even, even um, uh, when Muhammad uh, invented Islam, he did it as an attempt to synthesize their own religion with Christianity and Judaism. And one other one, um, uh, Zoroastrianism. So uh, any person who comes in here who says that I am a Muslim will say that I have very few arguments with you about religion. <laughs> you will say I have a lot of arguments with you about religion. But they will say I don't have a whole lot of arguments with you about religion. Because part of my religion is already built in Christianity. So fear of fees wasn't giving up a whole lot by doing it. It meant almost everything to possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I thought I'd go through that long spiel because we have because it's built into the story here. These things are built into the story. Um, what had just happened was what created the knights and what made them who they were was that uh, there was this big void in the Western world after the Roman Empire collapsed. And when any time some big power collapse, collapses, there are a whole lot of people rushing in to fill the void and get the piece of the action. Okay. Then came Islam. That lasted for a while, went back. And now you have the Dark Ages. And then when everything comes back together, you start having the Middle Ages. And when did you start having the Middle Ages? When Charlemagne <laughs> uh, started organizing all of these dukes under one king. Some people would say it was Otto the first, who came after Charlemagne, but nevertheless. Okay, so we're talking about a time now when uh, the, the West was ruled by Arabs who left. And you got this big void and you have these, uh, a feudal system, and the knights uh, serve a feudal lord. And there is this something about some of these knights that say, well, look, uh, yeah, we're ravaging the land and all of that, but there's got to be some principles on all of this. And some of these knights really did bring chivalry to a high peak level. 
Uh, and um, some of them even called themselves priests, like the Knights Templar. They thought of themselves as priests. So that's, that, that's, that's where we are with all of this. And that uh, one, of, one thing that isn't emphasized in here, uh, like it is other places, the killing of the dragon. Uh, is that the purpose of mythology is to hold a society together. And one of its functions is to, is to organize the men with the free time. And say, now, if you're going to kill somebody, they've got to be <laughs> okay. Uh, and why have these things lasted so long? Well, what we find out is that they've lasted a long time because they become metaphors for everybody's problem, big, your big problems in your life. And one that I like to talk about, make mention here, is uh, let's, let's entertain a problem, okay? Uh, you've just graduated. No, you not, haven't just graduated. You've graduated and you're working and you have sacrificed a lot and you've progressed in your company. Then your company is, is about ready to, is competing for a contract, uh, let's say with the Germans. And you're going to make, the company's going to make its pitch Monday morning. And you have to leave the team. Right. Sunday night, you get a call from your husband's um, mother in, in Arizona. The kids are out visiting. She's, your husband says one of the kids got hit by a car. Uh, the doctor says we, we don't know if the kid's going to last another two days. Now, do you go to that meeting on Monday? Or do you go to Arizona? All right. Go to Arizona. All right. Well, let me tell you what this heroic story is going to how this heroic story is going to help you with that decision. The heroic story says that your conscious mind uh, possesses, does not possess all of the knowledge that your mind possesses. Your unconscious mind, and I'm not talking about memories right now, I'm talking about parts of your conscious mind that are virtually permanent. The conscious there's some truths that are hidden down in your unconscious. Okay. And if you are able to get into a mythic state of mind, then what you will be able to do is to go down in your unconscious and find out if one of those monsters down there needs to be killed. Now, what kind of monster would be down there? Well, I'll tell you one kind that would be down there, your ambition. Because that your ambition is competing with that child. Now, it was unfair because I made you all mothers. But suppose uh, it was some people uh, that are going to die if you don't go help them as opposed to going... Uh, then you gotta, then you gotta face that de that demon down there. That's that's your ambition. And what you have got to do is to say that I would rather be dead than to continue to live a life of not being able to deal with these decisions. I gotta deal with this. Maybe my ambition is good for me. Or maybe it's got to be killed. But whatever it is, I've got to face the demon, and I am ready to die. Because that unconscious demon is lethal. 
in the real world. So if you decide that on somebody else's behalf, you are willing to kill the demon and to bring the truth back to your conscious mind. That's the best way to handle the problem. Whatever decision you come up with after that is the best you can do. And the metaphor is in the heroic story. So if you can get into the story to the point where you can get into Parzival's place and actually feel what Parzival feels and then get into some of these other stories where they're really killing dragons, uh, then what it does, what, what we know now, um, a thousand years later, is that if you embrace those things seriously and if you really feel that you are possible in there, then the wiring in your brain will change. And your 12-year-old will start looking like a 14-year-old not somebody who's going to be 18-year-old, still looking like a 12 year old, that your physiology, if you're young enough, will change. You will grow up. Now, uh, ancient people uh, and medieval people and early modern people do all of this before the science could prove any of it. Uh, better stated, better stated, they were willing to commit to it regardless of the country. So when they had their young kids coming along, particularly if they were afraid that the boys were going to have some free time. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's a nightmare if you got a 16-year-old on a Saturday night. I don't care how much you put into it. That can be a bad night for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know I was 16 years old. <laughs> Um, but if you read these stories to them, and if they can embrace them, then that's a big help. It's a, long, it's a big help. Uh, some people have said that Freud, no matter what, they, what, what others say, that he brought uh, the scientific method to the study of the mind, what they really say is that Freud was actually a mythologist because what he said was that that's the solution to your problem. Freud went one other step. This is very significant, and see if you can find it in any of these stories. Freud said that if you are an amateur fooling around with the unconscious, your unconscious or anybody else's, you may release the demon, but unless you make the demon morally acceptable to your conscious mind, the demon will get up there and run you to the insane asylum. And Freud talked about that in terms of, um, of uh, the co competition that boys have with the father and wanting to kill the father and take the father's place with the mother. Uh, and Mary Shelley made a big deal out of it with Frankenstein because what did Frankenstein want to do to kill his maker? <laughs> Down is wired down in the brain. Okay. Freud said, uh, if that's the truth, then that's a hard thing to justify morally. So it's best left down there unless you can find a way to bring it up morally. So mythology is supposed to do all that. Now, let's talk about how this thing fits into this class. All right. If you want to solve an ethical problem and you want to solve it by using the method of virtues, but you don't want to deal, you don't want the virtue, the list of virtues that Plato or any of those people had, but you want to find a character like I did with my first day on an engineering job, put that character in your place, work the character through it, and then imitate to some extent. That character. The question is what character to choose. It's not simply a matter of choosing a good person. Because in the end, what you want is to still have your job. See. All right. 
you might not, you, you have to be prepared to lose it. But what you want in the end is to have somebody on your side. Okay. Now, what, what the, the idea of the mythic story is that the mythic story provides a hero that is uh, not only a hero to you, but is a hero to other people. Right. And why is that? Because of the long story I just gave. It, 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 it's another thing that's sort of wired into the brain. That after a while, um, uh, people begin to see from these stories that uh, you know, there's there's something of me in these heroes. Why is that? All right. Um, all right. This is where Gestalt. And let's take the Necker cube again. What your brain actually sees is a three-dimensional figure. What's up there is 12 lines on a flat board. Okay. Um, when you're sitting around with your family, uh, is there one person that gets up that sort of like represents, <laughs> you know, your family, you know? Uh, is there such a thing as an MIT person? Can you go to the airport uh, and say, well, there are, there, are, there are 400 students out here, but that one is probably from MIT. Can you do that? Probably. Doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. The point is, you got a picture in your mind. Did I ever tell you a story about the old, uh, about the old blues at Yale? Yeah. When I, I was chair of the faculty senate, we were we had just gotten the constitution approved where we could get faculty members on the Board of Trustees. The question was, what kind of faculty member do we want? You get somebody that's quote unquote too scholarly, the, trust, the board won't understand. <laughs> uh, you get somebody who's too businesslike and he won't reflect the rest, or she won't reflect the rest of us. So what do you do? How do you deal with that problem? There was one faculty member there who got his uh, law degree from Yale. And he said, well, look, why don't you call up to the call up to the president's office and uh, ask for the person who staffs the uh, trustee. And when you get the person on the phone, ask them what an old blue is. I said, what's an old blue? He said, you ask the person. I said, okay. So I called them. They gave me the staff person for the trust board. And I said, what's an old blue? And she said, an old blue is a member of the faculty who looks like Yale. I understood that. I mean, it was abstract. I said, yeah, okay. Uh, and we concluded in the end, they said they come into board meetings. The board, meet, the board by some Yale tradition, is, is able to pick out who the old blues are. And the board brings them into the board meeting. And here's what really happens, uh, according to that conversation. That 95% of the time, the board is talking about what Yale lives for. But when they want to make a decision where they can gain a lot, maybe, they want to know what Yale is willing to die for. Then they turn to the old blues. Should we take this, take on this project? <laughs> Should we have a course in here on Islam? Uh, should we have um, uh, Jerry Falwell on the faculty? They look to the old blues. And the answer is not right or wrong. The answer is, is this Yale? If we do this, will we have Yale at the end? Well, that's a gestalt of, of Yale. And this tradition I'm talking about is Yale's mythology. Mythology will give you these old blues for a culture. And if an old blue is representative of the whole, then the old, the, the old blue is, has a part of each of us in him or her. And once she has done whatever she has done, no matter how bad it is, we all have a tendency to say, well, maybe she needs to be punished, but let's not be too harsh. You know, I mean, I might have done that. <laughs> or, you know, we are decent people here, but this is the best it gets with our family. So if you pull out a cultural hero and imitate a cultural hero, 
uh, my argument has been, and I'm not alone in this, that whatever you do in the end, uh, and no matter what, what, whether, the, whether they want to punish you for it, it will be a tendency for them to, to side with you or to forgive you or to see the point of what you did or something. Yeah. And it's hard for me to see nice Arthurian makes it cultural heroes. Yes. So I'm trying really hard to think metaphorically and see, first of all, our characters like as, as heroes that could help these decisions. But it's really tough because all of the activities that these knights engage in are not relevant to the decision. Um, so Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, you hit a very, very, a very um, important nerve, and that is that uh, there's some generational differences. Uh, and so the question is, why is it that possible meant so much to me? He was, I was not in his generation. No. You know. Um, and the key word in the end. Is metaphor because I did now now listen to me carefully because I, I want to choose my words properly here because if I mess up I could really throw everybody off All right when I had to make that decision on my first day uh, as an engineer I didn't see any difference between Parsifal and my uncle Roy Campbell says that the hero's journey has this path. We just went through it. First of all, you hear a call. Okay. That's really your unconscious trying to say, look, you better get down here. <coughs> all right. uh, you hear a call. You don't really want to do it because somehow you know that this can, thing can be lethal. But some. Somebody else makes the case that if you don't go, somebody else is going to suffer. So you got to go. Right. So the first thing is to hear the call. The second thing is the separation. You have got to go away from the comfort zone and into the unknown and the fabulous. That's very important. Fabulous. Fabulous. Not fabulous in terms of, uh, of, uh, of peacock feathers fabulous in terms of fable, that there are things that you are going to encounter that are not of this conscious earth. They're the demons in your unconscious. You got to slay a dragon because that's a, that's a real thing in your unconscious. And then when you slay the dragon, you have to bring back something like the truth. That's the holy grail. You've got to bring the grail back. And what do you do with the grail when you get back? You share it with everybody. Okay, so those, that's the pattern of the hero's journey. Look at Roy. Why was Roy a hero? Well, <clears throat> when they got back home, found out that all of the, their parents were dead, then they heard a call to do something for the children. But it wasn't staying there, working. So they had to go out. Uh, when they got down to Oberlin, that was just like being in a dream world for them. I've heard them talk about it. Okay. And when they got their degrees, what did they do with the degrees? They didn't go out and get a big job. They brought the degree back home to help the others get out. That was their holy grail. 
it's the same thing. So uh, what you've got to do is to look around you and find somebody you know. Now, you don't have to know them personally. But find somebody you know who has had that same experience. They don't have to be perfect people. Right? But if they have had that experience, and they are heroes in the sense that they're beautiful thing about these things is they don't hide as we just discussed the the negative sides of these people's characters i mean when you find out what is relevant in them that's heroic put them in one of your situations do your best or do what you think is right in terms of how you much you can follow them then once you have done it everybody else even if it's only on an unconscious level will see some sense in it and will have some compassion for you while you did it and will be inclined to say, well, you know, that's as good as, get, as it gets with us. And uh, you'll be the kind that if they sent to prison, you get your old job back when you get out. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, you'll be uh, like John Brown at... Uh, Rugby. Was it rugby? John, John Brown's school days was at rugby. I'm talking about this story about this American that goes to um, one of the British schools, and he does something very heroic, but he gets sent down for it, gets kicked out of school for it. Cold? Yeah. It's uh, Oxford. It's, it's uh, John Brown at Oxford. Well, anyway, what happens is he gets sent down for it. But when he's in the carriage leaving Oxford on the way to the, um, to the uh, port where he gets the boat home, all of the Oxford students out there cheering him on. <laughs> now, that's the kind of hero I'm talking about. If you've got to go, you're still, they still will treat you like a hero and think that what you did was, well, as good as it gets. All right. So... Um, my point is that we can bring virtue ethics back, but mythology is the way to go. And if you do mythology right, and this is another one of the things that Joseph Campbell takes credit for. That as a matter of fact, this is really the, the, the source of his fame, that what he found out was that uh, if you look at mythologies of all cultures, you'll find a whole lot of things in common. And the hero's journey is one of them. And there are different kinds of hero's journeys and all of that. But uh, so therefore, so your challenge then is to find somebody that you, like I said, that you know. You don't have to know them personally. They don't even have to be alive. You can read them out of books. Say, I know that person. Uh, but uh, and say that uh huh that person fits the pattern. And if I really get in some trouble and do what I think that person will do, it may not be the right thing. But somehow or another, I will still fit in the culture when it's done. It will be probably the best you can do. And um, uh, and I'm, and I was hoping. The only reason I was hoping that this would be a bigger class, the only reason, is that I was hoping that we'd have a whole lot of people in here saying, well, you know, where I'm from, uh, we got another story. And the hero didn't go out and ki uh, uh, kill a dragon. The, the hero went out and killed, um, you know, killed something else. Might be just as bad, you know. Uh, I've heard some stories from South Americans where person goes out and kills something in the forest. Well, even, even, the, even the anthropologists who study Oedipus say that he did not kill, it was a sphinx that he killed, um, uh, a lion with a person's head that was terrorizing the, terrorizing the populace. What they, what they did find something, and I don't know how they did it, but they found something. They said around that place at around that time, there was a there was a pestilence, a disease. And somehow or another, this man came in from outside and walked among the people and helped cure them. Well, how does it work 
12 generations later when it gets down in the unconscious into a story. Kill the dragon. So now what I want you to do, um, since y'all got all of this free time, is uh, to take this last paper that I've given you back and resubmit it, but you can change it if you want to. Uh, these are good papers, but what I want you to do is take the character that you analyzed and substitute Parsifal in there. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, then substitute some kind of hero in there and see what that person would have done in that situation. And what would have been the consequences to that person afterwards. What I would like for you to do is to try possible first. If it does not work for you, then choose another one. But justify why that person is a mythic hero. A mythic hero of some sort or another. They have to, like, for, like, like my uncle Roy and those. They 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 had the they followed the pattern. They heard the call. They went out for a higher cause. Had this fabulous experience. They killed the dragon. They brought the Grail home and shared it with everybody. There's the pattern. So see if the if the if that doesn't work, then pick another. St another case, the A7D or some other case that you've already studied. Okay. Now, I don't want to, as we all know, none of these methods will work every time on every, for everybody. But, uh, so, but I'd like for you to try possible on, a, on Chernobyl. 